let's set expectations up front. This Snapdragon X Elite equipped Surface Pro 11 is more performant than my Steam Deck for gaming. If that doesn't sound impressive, well, it's actually a huge step up from its predecessor, the Surface Pro 9, which, while decent in its own right, felt more like a novelty than a legitimate gaming computer. By contrast, the Surface Pro 11 should be a huge slam dunk for folks who love the stylish equipped productivity of Surface devices, want a hyper-portable computer with a decently sized screen, and still want to play newer AAA games at low to medium settings. Unfortunately, while plenty of my testing does support those statements, there are still some lingering vestiges of Windows on ARM jank that Microsoft hasn't quite quashed in the past four and a half years since the Surface Pro X. In this video, let's take a look at the Surface Pro 11's current capabilities, what changes are still needed for Windows on ARM to be perfect for gaming, and why you might still want to consider a Windows on ARM device for yourself. To start, uh, let's go over the specs of the device I'm using for testing. My model's equipped with a 12-core Snapdragon X Elite processor, 16 gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigabytes of upgradable storage, and a 13-inch 120 hz OLED display. For most folks, this should be the base configuration to consider if you're planning to do more than light gaming or have workflows involving either intense data work or video editing. For I.O., on the left-hand side are two USB 4 ports, and on the right is the standard Surface connector. More ports would always be better, but three ports are more than adequate for a tablet, especially since both the USB and Surface ports can be expanded with docking stations. I'm reusing the keyboard from my Surface Pro 9 at the moment, but if a gaming and media consumption are your goals here, you realistically don't even need a Surface keyboard. Touch navigation on Windows 11 is extremely solid at this point for folks who prefer controllers. Meanwhile, folks who don't can always connect their own keyboard and mouse. Surface keyboards are really only a must-have if you plan to make use of the Surface Pen, intend to use the Surface as a work device, or want a dual-purpose screen protector while traveling. Okay, enough about hardware, let's talk about gaming performance. To make it easy to follow, I'll be breaking this up into four separate chapters. Lightweight gaming, heavy gaming, emulation, and then some nifty Windows 11 features that tie it all together. Click around if there's one specific section you're curious in the most. Starting with lighter titles, like Dave the Diver, Pepper Grinder, or Hollow Knight. The Surface Pro 11 doesn't break a sweat. These are games that any modern Windows system should be able to run without too much complication these days, so it's not entirely unexpected. However, unlike many gaming laptops or handhelds on the market, the Surface Pro 11 can pretty much play those lighter games for a full workday without even resorting to battery saver mode or decreasing screen brightness. From my testing, I've observed Pepper Grinder draining about 14 to 17% battery per hour on default settings, full resolution display, and a recommended power profile. That translates to about five and a half to seven and a half hours of gameplay, depending on what I have going on in background. By comparison, my main Windows handheld gets about four hours in use if I really restrict the wattage of its processor, despite the Surface Pro 11 only have maybe a 15% larger battery capacity. That's fantastic for anyone looking to get one of these as a portable productivity machine who still wants the ability to play a few quick hands in Slay the Spire without demolishing the remaining charge. Not to mention, the kickstand makes plopping it down anywhere nice and easy, while the 120Hz HDR OLED display makes any games thrown at it look spectacular. The internal fan is also much quieter than any of my handhelds, providing only a soft whoosh when gameplay really intensifies. In a silent room, others will definitely know that your processing needs have increased, but it won't be as annoying as many of the other gaming laptops or handhelds out there. Consider this more of a whisper than a jet engine. Anyone who was hoping for Windows on ARM to become a hyper-efficient platform for portable PC gaming is 
definitely going to be pleased with what's available right now. With regards to lighter games, I really only have two caveats at the moment. The first is that this version of the Pro 11 lacks 5G support, which I've honestly missed quite a bit from my past week taking it around Chicago. For those looking for that version, you're going to be waiting for a while. Waiting might be worth it for some though, considering how useful 5G has been for me for cloud gaming, accessing cloud saves, and downloading various game files without having to fuss with my phone's hotspot. Secondly, if your main gaming interest is lightweight gaming and your other computer needs are mainly Microsoft's Office Suite plus a web browser, you might consider getting the less performance Snapdragon X Plus model instead. On paper, there's not a huge performance difference between the two models, but the lower powered X Plus may give that version a slight edge in battery life, while being more than performant enough to meet your processing needs. Plus, uh, you'll save a few hundred dollars in the process, especially if you don't mind upgrading your SSD after purchase. Where the decision to buy this more performant processor truly shines is when playing more demanding games, since any small boost in performance will be helpful in that arena. As I mentioned at the top of the video, the X Elite equipped Surface Pro 11 does pretty well with graphically intense games. While playing control at 720p low, I'm getting a stable 60 to 70 FPS on average, which is a giant leap forward from the 25 to 30 FPS I was getting with my Surface Pro 9 during my last review a couple weeks ago. These gains continue to plenty of other games, like The Witcher 3 and Another Crab's Treasure, where both games will happily run at 70 plus FPS for those willing to stick to 720p low or a respectable 40 to 50 FPS at higher resolutions or quality. Don't get me wrong, this isn't going to replace anyone's dedicated gaming laptop with a discrete GPU in terms of performance, but considering that it's just a thin, hyper-portable tablet, I'm still surprised at how well it's played these games, especially considering how past Intel-based Surface Pros weren't necessarily known for their gaming performance. But with great performance comes great cost, especially to battery life. Graphically intense games drain the tablet's battery a lot quicker than I might have expected. While playing Another Crab's Treasure, my wife saw the battery drain from 100% to 20% in about 80 minutes, allowing for up to an hour and 40 minutes of gameplay on a single charge. Regardless of settings she turned off or graphics quality she turned down, battery drains seem to remain flat over the course of a few tests. So yeah, don't expect to take the Pro 11 to spend more than a couple hours searching for your soul and shell by Lake Michigan or anything. Although in person, the display is also just bright enough to play games under direct sunlight. Not quite the computer strong point, but is still more than enough in a pinch. Nonetheless, while not spectacular, 100 minutes of gameplay is still fairly decent for such a lightweight system. To get near the same level of performance on either my Steam Deck or Flip DS, I'd be looking at around an hour or less of gameplay anyway. The main downside here, uh, unlike those machines, is that there are no fine-tuned controls for Qualcomm's chipset baked into lower wattage or control fan speed. On those other devices, I can sacrifice a bit of raw performance to extend battery life to maybe two or two and a half hours. Not having the option for the Pro 11 means I'm stuck with everything running at full speed all the time. It sucks, uh, but will probably always be a problem until the inevitable Windows and ARM handhelds begin to appear. Of course, to have those handhelds succeed, Microsoft and Qualcomm need to do something about the million pound elephant in the room, game compatibility. To their credit, the software updates Microsoft has made over the past year and a half that I've been using a Windows on ARM machine have made a ton of compatibility issues disappear already. Just a few weeks ago, Penny's Big Breakaway refused to load entirely on my Pro 9, yet the first time I tried it on my Pro 11, there was no sign of that previous issue. More than a few other games and emulators have had the same turnaround, 
and the combination of better software and higher performing chipsets has already done wonders for game stability. Plus, uh, let's not forget that the only other major ARM-based gaming platform folks are using right now is macOS. And, well, macOS still has very little Steam support, to say the least. Still, I've tried to launch more than a few games since getting my hands on the Pro 11, only to experience a variety of different errors. Games like Death Stranding, Ghostwire Tokyo, and Hi-Fi Rush crash immediately upon hitting play. Meanwhile, Elden Ring says it's just straight up not compatible with ARM-based hardware. Based on how well many of these games run on my Steam Deck or FlipDS, I've no doubt my Pro 11 has enough raw performance to make a decent effort at these games. It's just that something about either Microsoft's compatibility layer or how these games are built stops them from running at all. For gaming on ARM-based Windows machines to take off, Microsoft needs to, at the very least, lead the way by making compatibility as clear as possible for their first-party games and updating as many games as possible to at least launch on ARM-based systems. Within the Microsoft Store, they're part of the way there already with banners at the top of game pages to indicate perspective incompatibility as well as installation restrictions for those games, which is honestly pretty great. Now, uh, considering some of those banners are incorrect, they just need to provide more relevant info for ARM-based processors and start minimizing the number of games that need those banners in the first place. But still, compatibility rant aside, among the stuff that works, there is more than enough here to get folks interested. Early adopters might just need to do a little bit of research beforehand to make sure the games they want to play will actually work. Moving on, somewhere between the lighter and heavier native gaming experiences lies the wide world of emulation. To recap for new folks, a few major emulators have had versions of their software available for Windows on ARM for quite some time, including PPSSPP, AetherSX2, and Dolphin. All three of these native apps run exceedingly well on my Surface Pro 9 and continue to run even better on my more performant Surface Pro 11. Kind of like with the newest flagship Snapdragon smartphones these days, you can expect extremely solid emulation up to and including PS2 and Wii until you hit known edge cases for the software itself. The only real caveat is that Aether SX2 has been out of development for a while now. So don't expect updates to smooth out any wrinkles you might come across in PS2 emulation. Given the performance for these moderately heavy systems, it should also go without saying that emulating systems older than PS2 should also run exceedingly well, even if the applicable emulators don't have native apps. The Snapdragon X Elite is more than powerful enough to handle those older systems, even through a compatibility layer. Where emulation has typically started to get bad for Windows on ARM devices is with 3DS and Wii U emulation. In the past, Citra crashed shortly after starting a game, and Simu would only output a jumbled mess. That's all mostly in the past now, considering both Citra and Simu are very playable on the Pro 11. For both emulators, I tested half a dozen games or so. With Citra, I didn't run into any games that wouldn't launch at all but I did find some differences in compatibility. Certain games like Pokemon X, Super Mario 3D Land, or Mario vs. Donkey Kong, The Tipping Stars, ran at full speed, with only minor hitches on occasion, while at 3x native resolution. By contrast, Super Smash Bros. only ran at about half speed, even with the resolution cut back. Games that ran well also seem to take a bit longer to load compared to emulation on other systems, indicating that some work is still needed to be done for 3DS emulation on this platform. Jumping over to Simu, Wii U emulation is much more mixed. Super Smash Bros. refused to load at all, and Splatoon had so many graphical glitches that it was completely unplayable. However, Mario Kart 8, Yoshi's Whirly World, Pushmo World, and Wind Waker were all playable at full speed without significant issue. That is to say that while performance was great, 
each game still had varying degrees of visual glitches that made the experience less than ideal. For example, Mario Kart 8 doesn't render paragliders at all, and certain tracks have huge chunks of the road missing for whatever reason. Meanwhile, Yoshi's face in Woolly World is straight up missing alongside the bodies of many enemies. Bottom line, this is not the ideal machine to use for 3DS or Wii U emulation. But the performance does seem to be there for both emulators, just waiting for either an ARM-based version or some random update to solve the various glitches. All of which is also true for PS3 emulation, by the way. Our PCS3, for whatever reason, crashed immediately upon loading a game. So, I'll definitely need to play the waiting game for that one as well. Based on how much performance has advanced so far, I've got some hopes that compatibility with these emulators will get better in the future. Kind of like game compatibility in general, there will just need to be a high enough adoption of these machines to get devs interested in supplying fixes specifically for Windows on ARM. So far, I've covered both Windows gaming and emulation, and as a final topic, let's discuss a couple new software features arriving alongside Qualcomm's new processors. Both Auto HDR and Auto Super Resolution are two new graphics features which utilize the X Elite's NPU to algorithmically enhance gameplay. Auto HDR smartly brightens gameplay to add HDR mapping to games without proper HDR implementation. Meanwhile, Auto Super Resolution automatically drops resolution in game and uses machine learning models to essentially upscale the resolution while maintaining the higher frame rates afforded by the lower rendered resolution. Both features are things we've seen from both Nvidia and AMD before, but these features are now baked into Windows and bound to be more useful for more folks as they get computers with more performant NPUs especially since enabling either doesn't seem to come with a hit to performance or battery life. They seem right for becoming just another Windows tool that folks can use to tweak their gameplay a little bit more. That is, of course, if they actually work well. And, well, working well is a bit of a difficult thing to assess for the vast variety of games currently on the market, because performance does vary wildly depending on the game. Though I will say, whenever I've enabled either feature for games I've shown so far in this video, I've mostly liked the result. Auto HDR in particular has been really nice for changing the mood of gameplay. Using it with Hollow Knight really highlights the game's stark white characters against the deep blacks of the background. Swirling colors and certain rest pools look far more vibrant here than anywhere else, and it's so freaking good. Meanwhile, enabling Auto HDR for Mario Kart 8 changes the tone of gameplay entirely. Everything becomes extremely contrasty, with skylights providing really punchy highlights. It all gives me the vibes of those random Mario but in Unreal Engine videos that pop up every now and then. I'm not sure if this is necessarily better than the original color scheme, but it's great for providing a fresh feel to a game I've invested so much time into over the years. Auto SR is uh, likewise no slouch. Its benefits don't seem to be quite as obvious to me in the moment while playing a game, but side-by-side -side comparisons I've made during testing make the differences with it enabled fairly obvious. I definitely don't think it's quite as robust as DLSS or FSR, you know, NVIDIA or AMD solutions, especially since I've noticed it affecting shadows in certain weird ways, but it's interesting as a first generation attempt. My hesitation to say that either feature will work well for you, however, is entirely due to some games not being compatible. Many games will automatically show up in graphic settings to enable either feature, other games need to be added manually by finding the executable on my computer. Whether a game shows up or not doesn't actually mean that enabling either feature will do anything at all. Sonic Mania, for example, showed on the list after my first launch of the game, but refuses to do anything with Auto HDR. In general, I've had more success than failures 
but it's still all trial and error, especially when adding non-Steam games and apps. Altogether, both AutoHDR and AutoSR are really neat features to mess around with, but it'll be worthwhile keeping it in mind that they're still first-generation products that may not work perfectly. Ultimately, looking back at all of my testing, I keep coming back to the Surface Pro 11 being a surprisingly great gaming machine. The Snapdragon X Elite combined with continued Windows 11 updates have resulted in proof that Windows on ARM could potentially be a valid gaming platform with its machines also being a bit more efficient in the process. Add in the nice bump to 3DS and Wii U emulation this time around combined with the utility of Auto HDR and Auto SR, and I wouldn't hesitate to recommend the Surface Pro 11 for someone looking for a portable gaming machine that they can also use to get real work done. Or at least I really want to recommend it. For gaming nerds like me who are interested in new hardware, as much as they are in finding new ways to play games, uh, something like the Pro 11 is going to be excellent. However, for the average person, I think the lingering question of game compatibility is still pretty large. If someone's looking for a laptop or a tablet with the best uninterrupted game performance, the Pro 11 still has some ways to go. But still, early adopters are bound to have a fun time with what's available right now. With all that in mind, most folks are realistically interested in buying a Surface Pro for its productivity work or stylus support. If they want to play games, that's mostly a cherry on the top more than anything. That's why for the next month or so, I'll keep using my Surface Pro 11 as my main computer for a variety of tasks from sketching in Adobe Fresco to editing in DaVinci Resolve to pushing Power Query in Excel to its limits. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on all that, be sure to get subscribed so that you don't miss out. Of course, if there's anything immediate you'd like me to check out, make sure to add a comment below and I might be able to help you out, as long as the asked isn't too obscure. As always, if you found this video helpful or informative, go ahead and give it a like to let me know, and then maybe go check out my latest Surface Pro 9 review to contrast it to the performance shown in this video. I've seen those going for about half price on the secondhand market lately, and honestly, I think most folks might still only need its level of performance for most tasks. In the video description, I'll also have additional details for other games I tested but didn't have space to show off in this video. Alongside that, I'll have the specific details regarding the settings used for battery life claims mentioned earlier, in case you have an ARM-based device of your own that you want to compare and contrast. If you happen to purchase the X Plus Surface Pro 11 or one of the various new ARM laptops that launched recently, I'd especially be interested in how your machines are holding up against mine. But hey, this has been a long video with a lot of testing already. Thank you so much for staying all the way until the end. I really hope this video was helpful in some way for getting a better grasp on the Pro 11. But anyway, it's gonna be all for this video. Until next time, catch you later.